All right, everyone. Good afternoon. On behalf of Columbia University, the School of Professional Studies, and our Masters in Wealth Management program, it is an honor to welcome you all to this, our fifth speaker series event, where from time to time, we invite industry leaders to come and share with us their thoughts and perspectives on the fast evolving wealth management industry. My name is Philip Hecker. I am a senior advisor to the program, and I'll be your moderator today. Today's topic of children and wealth is an important one, close to all of our hearts. And before I introduce our three great panelists who will really bring this topic to life, allow me a few short words on our new master's program, and let me give you a feel for the arc of today's conversation. Columbia University's Master's in Wealth Management is a 16-month part-time online program that prepares experienced and aspiring wealth management professionals to tackle the many challenges and opportunities that our industry provides. It is currently the only Master's in Wealth Management offered by an Ivy League institution, and we are proud to be CFP board certified. Should you wish to learn more, simply type Columbia University and Wealth Management into a web browser of your choice. With respect to today's conversation, we'll have a 45-minute or so panel conversation on the topic at hand, and we're looking forward to the insightful perspectives and actionable practical tips from our panel experts. We're also opening up to Q&A at the end. So please folks, as we go along, do not be shy. Please type your questions into the Q&A and chat functionality at the bottom of your screens. And with that, let's welcome, let's weave in our three great panelists. We're joined today by Stacy Allred, Mac Gardner, and Oliver Porsche. Welcome to you all. Why don't each of you please take 90 seconds, two minutes to briefly introduce yourselves, your companies, and the role that you play in these great companies. Ladies first, Stacy, then please Oliver and Mac. Well, thank you so much for having me. Really excited about this dialogue today. Stacy Allred and I lead the family engagement and governance team at First Republic. Uh, we are a bank that started 36 years ago, and I would say we're really, the reason I chose to join First Republic two years ago was just the extraordinary level of client service. My pathway into this, I started off at EY, Masters in Tax, Analytical Training and Thinking, and as I was designing comprehensive financial and estate plans at the height of the dot-com in San Francisco, I'll age myself here 22 years ago. Um, I kept getting all the qualitative questions around wealth. And what I really came to appreciate as I was experiencing this tremendous energy behind the qualitative questions around wealth is that we as an industry had done an amazing job with tax, with investments, with fin financial and estate planning. But where we were really lacking, where we had not yet built out uh, the field was around the more qualitative impact of wealth. And so it was in that journey of figuring out how can I be more intentional about the impact my wealth has on me, family, and community, right, with, alongside with families as a thinking partner, led me into this space. So long story short, Philip, I cold called wealth psychologists. I asked them the questions I was getting, and my life became a lot more exciting. Awesome to have you. Thanks for joining us. Next, please. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Oliver Porsche. Um, I started in the industry roughly 30 years ago, 29 and a half years ago uh, as a broker, but quickly pivoted over to more the institutional side. And uh, for the last 15 years prior to my current role as an advisor, really worked in a family office environment, ultimately running the family office. And one of the things I really learned and observed in that 15 year period is how difficult it is for matriarch or patriarch to really corral the family around uh, the same objectives, the same passions, and teaching the younger generations about the importance of wealth and the responsibility that comes with it. 
which is why I decided two years ago to join Wealthspire, which is an independent registered investment advisory firm. We have roughly $20 billion in assets under management, so we're large enough to really be able to have the infrastructure and the support services necessary to positively impact people's lives. And ultimately speaking, I look at my role as an advisor as somebody to help families make smarter financial decisions. Danke, Oliver. Great to have you. Last, not least, Mr. McGardner. Well, first and foremost, Philip, Stacy, Oliver, <clears throat> thank you all for allowing me to spend all the time and the attendees, of course, of this, uh, this webcast. My name is Matt Gardner. I am a certified financial planner. I have uh, been blessed to serve in this industry for 20 plus years um, in a lot of different capacities, uh, private uh, wealth management, uh, trust administration, commercial corporate lending, uh, advanced markets, a lot of really fun things. But what was interesting for me, what changed my direction was uh, when I had my practice, uh, I wrote my first book. And my first book is titled Motivate Your Money. And I wrote this book because I've been working with very, very wealthy people over the years, but it was just mind blowing how little financial literacy or personal financial education these very wealthy people had. And so that was my first book about a year into my practice. One of my uh, clients came to me and said, Mac, love what you're doing for adults. Love your Mac nuggets, how you simplify a lot of these financial concepts for adults. Would you be open to creating something for children? And that is when I wrote the book, The Four Money Bears. I don't know if folks can see it on here. I don't have a copy, but that's, that's my children's book, The Four Money Bears. And the book was created to help parents with young children start the conversation about money. Because if you never had it as a parent, how can you sh share or start the conversation with children? My current firm, Finlit Tech, which I'm the founder and chief education officer, came about because so many people have used our book, love the book, but young people are learning differently. They are learning through technology. And so what we do here at Finlet Tech, our mantra is to build a bridge between financial literacy and financial technology. And we develop games and resources to help start the financial literacy, financial education process at a very early age. Mac, great to have you. I hope the audience agrees. We have three experts that are deeply versed in the space coming at it from related but slightly different angles. I hope that shines through throughout the following discussion. Before we dive into the meat, into the discussion itself, let's get to know you on the personal basis even better. A quick round of icebreaker type quick questions, quick answers around the horn. Stacy, Oliver, Mac, that's the sequence. Favorite book you've recently read? Uh, Think Again by Adam Grant, amazing book. Uh, Where the Crowd Act Sing. So my wife, Jan, loves that movie. I love the book. And the movie's out on Netflix. So that's been on our list of things to watch, Oliver. Uh, so interesting. Well, the book that. is terrific. I haven't seen the movie. <laughs> so Jan, Jan says it all the time. So the most interesting book that I, I recently reread was actually The Richest Man in Babylon. I don't know for those folks who are out there who, who are all about, I, I literally stumbled upon it recently and I read it years ago, but it's a great book for folks about managing money. Good ones to take down. Two more quick questions. Most recent or upcoming interesting travel destination? I went to Mykonos, Greece, which is an island that does not allow cars, only donkeys. And it's fabulous if you haven't been there. I'll be going to Turks and Caicos again, but uh, the interesting component will be my first ever free dive. So we're aiming for 120 feet in uh, two minutes and 30 seconds underwater. Awesome. All right. For us, uh, we are cruiseaholics and uh, we took the kids. I have three, uh, three children. And so we did Jamaica, Cayman, and a third, I think it may have been Mexico. That was over making us jealous last quick question for now if you could have a person over for dinner dead or alive you can pick anybody who would it be 
So Philip, I first need to correct my prior answer. It was it was Idra that was the island with that was my favorite. We uh, we went to multiple islands in Greece. So Idra. Okay. That I would invite Maya Angelou. Uh, I love her quote. I think of it all the time. Do the best you can, and when you know better, do better. So I would love a conversation with the poet. Uh, that is, uh, I, I've been thinking about the answer knowing that I have more time and still can't necessarily come up. But somebody like Madeleine Albright, um, I think fascinating political figures that really, really had an impact on changing the landscape of the world. I love your answer, Stacy, And here's why. My favorite quote from that esteemed author People, for, pe people forget what you say, people forget what you do, but they never forget how you make them feel. But my guest for dinner would be Bob Marley. I think his music has been so profound. His message to this day in a lot of different ways uh, still resonates with a lot of people. And uh, of being of Caribbean descent, he would be someone that I'd love to just pick his brain and, and hear what he thinks about things. Awesome. With that, Let's dive into the topic at hand, children and wealth. In terms of context, I think it's fair to say there are two important dynamics at work by way of context. Number one, many parents instinctively know that the topic matters. They want to introduce their children to the important concepts of money and wealth, but they oftentimes don't quite know when and how to do that best. That's context impression one I wanted to share. Context impression number two is that when we think about financial advisors and their view on the world, many of them also instinctively know that this topic matters and they want to support their client and prospect families. And they want to connect with the next generation of the client family in early and constructive ways. But perhaps they also oftentimes struggle when and how exactly to do that. That in my mind, that client dynamic and that advisor dynamic is some important context to be aware of. So against that context, let's start perhaps with the notion of financial literacy. And if you don't mind, let's go around the horn, Stacy, Oliver, Mac. How do you define it? What is financial literacy in your mind? And why does it matter? Why should advisor care about this topic? So I define financial literacy as the knowledge and the skills needed at each unique life stage to make informed financial decisions. And uh, it, to me, it's a really ongoing dynamic topic, right? The financial literacy skills you need at age five might be more around um, save, spend, and share, and learning that important skill of delayed gratification. You know, I'm thinking of my kids when they were that age. We did a thing with heifer. We saved up five hundred dollars to buy a cow, and it. Uh, we had a jar. It was very visual, right? And it's that teaching that delayed gratification through experience. Um, and why does it matter? It, it, as you think about the entourage of information that we have right now, it used to be that we had a bit of a scarcity, right? And it was really valuable. Now we have the opposite problem. There's way too much information and there's a lot of disinformation. And so if we think of ourselves now, advisors are a little bit more like museum curators where you're looking at that vast sea of information and trying to take the best and the brightest of it. And in a way that's understandable, this idea of elegant simplicity, I'm thinking of the Oliver Wendell Holmes quote of, I wouldn't give a fig for simplicity on this side of complexity, right? We don't wanna oversimplify it, but I'd give everything I have for simplicity on this side of complexity. So I think with all of the information out there and this vast need for financial literacy to at its core, make informed financial decisions to improve the well-being of self, family, and community. Those are uh, a, a, few, a few initial thoughts. 
Excellent. Thank you for sharing that, Oliver. Yeah, I mean, I agree with Stacy. I have a slightly different tilt, although certainly agree with her. Um, I think it's important to understand that financial literacy is an ongoing process. You're never done learning. And, and part of that is because our industry, the investment world, the estate planning world continues to evolve. There's new laws, there's new opportunities. If you think about it, 25 years ago, the first ETF came out. That didn't exist. It's basically just a better mutual fund. Um, the way I look at it is it's a process. You're never too young to start, whether that's a five-year-old, a 15-year-old, a 25-year-old, doesn't matter. And it's really, to me, it's about learning to become an adult in terms of finances, starting to make the smart decisions, understanding that while it's boring and tedious, budgeting matters. Um, delaying gratification, as Stacy said, matters, right? If it's always, I get it now, I get it now, then you're going to get yourself into trouble. And, you know, while everybody tends to learn differently, um, whether that's by writing things down, by hearing things, by drawing them, we all remember stories. And so to me, I try to communicate the various lessons, the various thoughts with my clients and my clients' children via stories, uh, because I find that that's how they retain them best and it kind of tends to resonate with them. Oliver, before we get to Mac, let me respond to that. It's interesting to me that in both of your definitions, the dynamic nature comes through loud and clear. I heard that from Stacy. I heard that from you. And I would add to it, besides the dynamic evolution of solutions, you draw the parallel to the investment world via the ETFs, and there are plenty of evolving solutions in the children and wealth world, which Mac will get to. The children themselves, the people themselves are evolving as well, meaning the cognitive capabilities of a four-year-old versus 14-year-old versus 24-year-old differ greatly, thus being age-appropriate and thoughtful in how one builds a program not only leveraging the latest capabilities, but also being in line with the capacity to understand, absorb, and engage on the kids' front strikes me as potentially very important. We'll get to the how plenty in the next round. Let's continue focus here on what is it and why should we bother, Mac? So... I love the two S's of simplicity from Stacy, as well as story from Oliver. Uh, we view financial literacy as a component of an overall formula to attain financial wellness. That's where people are really trying to get to, right? We want to have some semblance of financial wellness. You know, you want to <laughs> you want to have this good relationship. So, financial literacy in our mind is the knowledge, is the education. But you can, go, you can Google bank account, financial literacy, and say to your point, there's tons of information out there. But if you do not provide people with the financial capability or tools to implement this knowledge, what, what's, what's, what's the sense? What's the use of it, right? And to your point, Phil, finding tools or developing tools to meet people where they are is extremely important. And so I talk about the, the three R's of our relationship with money. The first R, you realize what money is, right? Someone drops a dollar bill in your hand and says, hey, this is money. Oh, okay, great. The second R is you rationalize what money does for a lot of people. They know they've spent it, know they can save it, especially young people. And then you start to, so you, 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 you realize, you recognize, and then you rationalize how to use the money. That's where financial literacy comes in is during that recognition phase, right? Is explaining to people what those options are so that you can then rationalize how to use it down below. So that's why financial literacy is so important. Excellent. So what I take away in terms of definition, describing the beast, dynamic, age appropriate, building on each other, tools, that can get used to build competencies, to shape mindsets, to express values, and Mac, the three R's that you seem to focus on around realizing, 
rationalizing and recognizing interesting frameworks, which I'm sure we'll bring to life mm -hmm. in the following rounds of discussion. With that, let's pivot to the next round, which is, okay, now that we have a better understanding of what financial literacy is and why it may matter, how do we broach the topic with our client families? When and how do we do that? How do we help them? What tips, resources, exercises, activities do you use? And last not least, if you don't mind weaving in, what kind of impact does that have on A, the client family, and B, your business, your firm? So how do you do it? When and how? Practical tips. And what's the impact? The next focus of discussion. Same order, Stacy Oliver Mack. Okay, great. Well, during um, quarantine, when I think a lot of us had a little extra time on our hands as we weren't on a plane uh, every week, like perhaps before, um, I started working with the two well psychologists I had cold called uh, 20 years earlier. And um, we were, were developing something around governance. A lot of my work is designing really kind of sophisticated governance for these families experiencing and thoughtfully navigating multi-generational wealth. And we had the insight that it didn't matter you know, how well constructed these governance structures would be if the family members themselves didn't have the skills necessary right, to operate in the level of complexity that these structures create. I'm thinking, Oliver, of your world and the family office, right? The uh, as, as trusts and LLCs and everything are created, it really creates this intense complexity for a family member. And so as we stop to pause and really think about what are the skills needed for each family member in each life stage? And I kind of chuckle because all too often, what happens for us as advisors is family uh, parents come in and they say, our kids need financial education. And yes, that's true. So oftentimes, this is one of the things that we get a request for. But we were able to broaden the dialogue and to say, yes, your kids do need financial education. That's important. But that's one of 10 core competencies needed across 10 life stages. So long story short, we designed a 10 by 10 learning roadmap that developed out 10 core competencies, starting with financial skills, five external, what you know, five internal, who you are, the social and emotional learning, the EQ, and uh, the way that we use it. And I would just say it's the model is included in this wealth of wisdom, um, top practices, which is a book that came out earlier this year. It's an, an amazing book by a, a collection of authors on practical tools, um, helpful for our audience. So in the 10 by 10 learning roadmap, at each life stage, we invite them to opt into the learning journey. We have kind of curated the activities uh, relevant in each life stage, and we invite them to, uh, to choose where, what they're most curious about first. Um, and, and that can all be found in, in the chapter in that book. Excellent. Interesting approach. Oliver, from your end. Yeah, so I start the conversation almost in the first meeting before a family becomes a client. And I, I will preface that with saying it's important to recognize that every family is different to some extent or another. So there's no right or wrong answer. There isn't, you know, you have to answer it this way. It ultimately for me boils down to saying to the parents who are gonna be the clients initially, what do you want? And understanding what they want. And then from there, getting through a number of questions and a dialogue that also asks, how much do you want your children to know? That's a very, very important question because some parents, wealthy families, don't necessarily want their children to know exactly how much money they're going to get and inherit because they feel like they're too young or it's somehow going to impact them in a way that the family doesn't wish. So asking the parents, how much do you want the kids to know is important. And then when appropriate, and depending on the family, that's always going to be at a different time, 
engage with the children, ask them what they want. Uh, and it's kind of a learning process. Um, it is disciplined, it is you know structured, but it's also open recognizing that the timing of these conversations is going to be fluid because as I said, everybody's different. And ultimately speaking, where you wanna to get to is saying, yes, financial literacy is important. That is a component of life, an important one, but let's figure out a way so that in general, you're learning how to make smarter decisions about everything. That to me is really what it comes down to. Oliver, let me jump in here and ask both you and Stacy, what proven successful ways of asking the question of broaching the topic do you have? Literally, Oliver, what do you say? How do you frame the questions? So to the parents, I simply yes. say, what do you want to accomplish with your money? You're worth, da, 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 da. what do you want? One of the questions I like to ask, and especially with more uh, with middle age, so let's call them between age 40 and 60, so not quite retired yet, they have kids, they're active, they're working, they're do dealing with a lot of stuff. I asked a very simple question. I always am amazed at the answer. Describe your perfect weekend. And I'll give you an illustration. One of my clients, it's a billionaire family, billion dollar plus family. Uh, the matriarch, as I asked her that question, looked at me and said, I would love a long weekend away with my friends and my, my closest friends and family where I don't have to do anything. And I looked at her and I won't use her name. And I said, well, you've got plenty of staff like this ought to be easy. But it really uncovered the fact that she has such a desire to control every component of a weekend that she's always busy and involved. And we could work on that with her. And we did work with her on this to kind of say, okay, well, why don't you just delegate and let your husband plan the full weekend and sit back and relax. And it was transformative for her because it was the first time that she kind of figured out, yeah, it's okay. I don't have to be involved in everything. That sounds like my household. <laughs> <laughs> Stacy, let me put you on, on, the, on the hot seat in a positive way. I'm weaving in a question I got via email from one of our students. And that is, I think, a very good question. Not every family, although they may need to, might be willing to lean in on financial literacy. So assume that as an advisor, you work with a family and you see that the next generation would benefit from, you know, some insights, education, information, competencies when it comes to financial literacy, but the parents don't seem to be interested. Oliver, it's not what they want. What is your role as an advisor? How far do you go in potentially leaning in? And if you do it, very delicate, how do you do it? So my experience is that this is one of the easiest things to get families to engage in. I mean, most people, if you if you really separate, there are financial skills and there are wealth skills. And every family, regardless of their balance sheet, needs financial skills, right? How do, what does it mean to earn, save, spend, share, invest money? How do I make those smart decisions? The issue is that the, in financial abundance, the lessons that are taught very naturally in a family of limited means aren't, aren't taught. You have to put some constraints, right? In a family of limited means, I know opportunity costs. Do I go on vacation this year or get the, the flat screen TV? When I have abundance, it takes a lot more work, right? It's that inverted U curve of parenting gets harder right? It, that's in, in that one of Malcolm Gladwell's books, The uh, Inverted U Curve. It, money makes parenting easier, but at a certain point, the U, the curve inverts and it makes it harder and you have to be much more intentional. So in practice, I think this is one of the easiest things on ramps to parents. The way I ask the question is generally, I might start as simple as, um, you, you know, if it's an initial meeting, what are your top three priorities at the intersection of family and wealth? And if you're meeting with a couple for them to each answer that individually and with a, a very high probability that financial literacy is going to be one of the 
pieces that are needed in that formula to get you to one of those three uh, priorities. So I find that it's a really natural, uh, easy topic where, again, I would distinguish is parents might not be open to wealth conversations, right? That's, but in general, they're very open to financial conversations. And if I could just add one more thing quickly, when you do it, it has to be creative, right? If, if we want to be really respectful of, we have right and left brain people, and I've heard from the right brain family members, right? I love my financial advisor, but he or she is so boring when they talk about investing. We don't want to be boring. And so one example of how we were not boring was we, um, we planned a group at an event at um, the Boston Red Sox. We got two suites. We invited in young adults, the client, the, the children, young adult children of our clients, and we designed something around nine innings. And it was opening pitch, earn, save, spend, share, um, a triple a, a triple hitter for uh, invest, 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 the seventh inning stretch or share and closing pitch. Anyways, a long way of saying, get really creative when you're teaching financial literacy, make it an experience, make it sticky, use the stories that, that Oliver talked about. But in general, I would say this is, I don't know what my pan, other panelists think, this is a pretty easy on-ramp that can come up very naturally. Yeah, I've, I've got to jump in. I've got to jump in here because I'm hearing so much goodness from folks here. I heard years ago someone say, "If for, this is for the financial advisors out there, if you take care of a client, they're thankful. If you take care of their child, they're forever grateful." All right. And so, part of the reason why we wrote this for money beers book was we, in, in my first book, I talk about the five steps to financial success, right? You have to have a plan, <laughs> plan accordingly, spend cautiously, save diligently, invest wisely, and give generously. If you follow those five steps over time, amazing things can happen in your financial life. But then we started doing research to really find out where the connectivity with money happens for people, for young people. And there was a Cambridge study years ago that said that a child's connectivity with money starts by age seven. So think about that. If you're going to be developing tools, creative fun tools for a seven-year-old, it better be entertaining. It better be something where you can sit down and, and the kids will, will be drawn to it. And what we did was we worked to simplify those four functions of money. And we created spender beer, saver beer, investor beer, and giver beer. And back to those three R's and how this ties in, Philip, to your point. Remember that first R of realizing what money is? Okay, child holds money, person holds money, they realize what it is. That second R is the, is, is, is the recognition of the functions of money. For most young people, that recognition is only twofold. They know they can spend it, they know they can save it. No matter how many commas are in the overall family portfolio, those are the first two. But there are four functions. So imagine if we can start opening the mind's eye of a young person to the fact that you have four options when it comes to money. Imagine how they can then rationalize how to use money, why investing is important, why giving is important. And so that's why we think, you know, it's important to start it early. It's important to find tools that are fun, that are meeting people where they are, right? And that we believe over time will, will, will really help the children and the family when it comes to passing wealth for generations. I mean, I, I agree with Stacey. It, it is an easy conversation. Look, I, in my experience, the two topics that are very difficult for parents to speak to their children about are sex and money, right? Th those are the two that they kind of just get stumped. We're going to help with the latter, with the money part, with the investment, the wealth, the financial literacy. And if you tell a client, if you tell somebody, let me help you, communicate this, I've never been turned down on that conversation. Let me double click on the wealth aspect of that conversation, because I think Stacy correctly said that that aspect can be much more family by family bespoke. Some are being very open about their net worth, balance sheet, you know, place and trajectory. Others, for good or bad reasons, much less so. As financial advisors, what are your thoughts and observations on that? 
how do you define that your role what are your do's and don'ts around that sensitive dimension of disclosure of wealth i like to share a statistic with people and of course it all depends on, on how much the the net worth is of the family that you're sitting with but i share a statistic with folks and said you know how often do you think once an estate is inherited statistically how long do you think it lasts and carries on to the next generation people's like oh 10 i was like no, 18 months in 18 months depending on the net worth that you have inherited assets are gone and the reason why a lot of times those inherited assets are gone is because conversations aren't being had between generations about how long it took one generation to amass this wealth and that value system or that value set isn't passed on for that next generation to realize, oh, mom and dad built a business worth 15, 20 million dollars, which is why they have it. And if they don't pass on those, those values in the education, it can be it can be depleted quickly. And so that's why I relay to clients the importance of having that education and the importance of disclosing to the next generations why it's so important to talk about it, even though they don't want to. Yeah, I, I agree. So I guess a couple of points. Uh, it is highly personal and there is no right or wrong answer. I like to say when I have a family or, or a couple that I'm in, in front of and they tell me they're not prepared at this point, and that's usually how they phrase it or something along those lines. I'm not, I don't think my children are ready to know this or I don't want them to know this yet. It opens up the conversation, not to talk about when do you think they'll be ready, but why? What is the issue? Oh, I think that if they knew that they're going to inherit $5 million, they're not going to work hard. Well, that goes back to financial literacy and overall education and making smart decisions. So it's really about opening up the dialogue, understanding what the real concerns are, I fundamentally believe that every parent wants the best for their children. I also fundamentally believe that they want to be open and share with their kids, share information, share knowledge, ultimately share wealth, whether it's passing down a business, which privately held businesses are an animal all of their own. And I've got some experience there in terms of succession planning. But fundamentally speaking, parents want to do that but they have concerns. And so understanding where those concerns come from, what they are, and then coming up to Stacey's point, point, coming up with creative, they have to be genuine, but creative solutions saying, okay, I can help with that, right? Being a wealth manager isn't just saying, pick this stock or invest here, or you have to save that much. It's about that real interaction with the family and helping to solve some of those real critical questions and problems that these families face. I'm loving this conversation. And I would say this is where I spend a lot of my time. This is one of the most common questions we get is this uh, real anxiety around, I know I need to start to have some of the wealth conversations, but I just don't know where to start. And, uh, um, and to the point, right, really of what they fear. They don't want it to undermine motivation to kind of, you know, they're on a good path now. How do you, how do you start? So the first thing that, uh, um, that I do is try and do some myth busting. And I think that one of the myths that's still out there is that when I have a wealth conversation, I need to un unveil the whole balance sheet, right? And, and one young man shared with me how his father called him and his brother over at breakfast one day, had the net worth on the computer screen and said, here's how much money we have. You get half, you get half any questions. So, whoa, they had the wealth conversation, <laughs> right? God. Full disclosure. Um, that's certainly one way to do it, but we think a much more effective way to do it is through a series of thoughtful conversations over time and not starting with the numbers. You work into that over time. The, the whole idea here is sharing the right amount of information at the right time. So if you bust the myth that the wealth conversation is the unveiling of the full balance sheet and say that the wealth conversation is really about values, philosophy, operating principles, 
what does it mean to be a member of our family of wealth? And when you talk to the rising gen, they're pretty astute, you know, like they, uh, they know how to Google, they look at the way you demonstrate your wealth. And so really, if you're not talking about it in the right way, the message you're sending is we don't talk about money in our family. And so I think that we do have a tremendous responsibility, Philip, going back to your question, is advisors to push, gently push and support and provide them, help them design a framework and a method that they're comfortable so that they take that courageous step. When something has tension around it, we can either avoid or approach, you know, like broadly speaking, and how can we as trusted advisors move from the avoid, which happens all too often with the wealth conversation and help them approach. And I would, I would end with two things. We, we could spend the whole webinar on this, but I'll end with two things. One is that what happens when you take that courageous step with plenty of preparation and you know, there might be a handwritten letter, you're using a framework, you're thinking about in each individual family member, you're getting clarity on the purpose of the wealth and what it means to them right now in their life stage. Uh, what can they expect? What can they not expect? And most importantly, what's essential of each family member, right? And now we can start to have that series of thoughtful conversations. And I'll end with a, a, a quick story uh, an experience I had that sticks with me to this day and keeps me very motivated to help families have these wealth conversations. And the story is this, we were in a family meeting with generation two and three, and they wanted to know so badly the intent of the wealth, the wishes of the wealth creators, the grandparents who were deceased, that we called in out of retirement, the estate planning attorney to be the voice of those grandparents. And what a lost opportunity for those grandparents to take the time, you know, if they would have just taken the time to write the letters, to have the dialogue, to, you know, it would have made a tremendous impact. I mean, talk about a 10X factor. So sometimes I tell that story and I, I share the viewpoint of the rising gen, they have said to their parents, we feel so respected that you brought us into your inner circle and you're having these meaningful conversations. So, so great question. Thank Bill, you. I'd just add one quick thing. I, I think it's also important to express to, to parents, to the ones who are about to have this conversation, you don't have to treat each child identically. Right? Everybody is different. Uh, I'm working with a family. It's four children. The eldest son probably still has the first nickel that he earned on his paper route at age 10. Um, the eldest daughter, who is an equestrian, has more horse equipment than she's ever made in her life. In terms he's a spender bear. And so, he's a saber bear. <laughs> exactly. And, and so treating it's okay to treat children with reflection of their personality. Um, because as long as the intent is to treat them fairly and in what's the, in their best interest, that to me is perfectly fine. Oliver, thank you for sharing that. It seems to me that being fair does not always mean being equal. That's the way I think about it. That's, I think, the message you're trying to relay. Stacy, I couldn't help, as I listened to your great contributions, to come full circle to the start of this conversation where you emphasize the dynamic nature. This topic, financial literacy, wellness, competencies, is not just about being young and starting early. It goes throughout the entire life and the entire relationship between the various generations, including letters of intent, when grandparents are hopefully very old and receiving parents are old, no longer children. So thank you for sharing that. I will also share with you as we conclude this round that from my perspective, how an advisor approaches this topic of children wealth tells a lot about how that advisor defines herself. What is her role? How does she view, Oliver, to your earlier comment, the role of being an advisor? Is it, you know, quote unquote, just investments or is it more than that? And from all three of you, I think we've heard loud and clear the many opportunities 
the difficult but important work caring client-centric advisors can do around children and wealth. We have time for one more quick round. As we dive in there, let me encourage the audience to send their questions via the Q&A function. I have a few from our students via email that we'll use at the very end. But as we dive into this third and last round, this is going to be panelist specific. So each of you will get a specific question. And we're actually going to reverse the order here. So Mac, starting with you, you are, given your background and current seat at the forefront of children, financial literacy, and technology. Please share with us emerging tech trends, opportunities that we as young or mid-career advisors should be aware of. Yeah, I, the first thing that pops to mind when I hear the word technology, fintech, right? Fintech is changing how we do everything <laughs> when it deals with our finances. I joke around when I do these interviews. I'm like, I, I can I can do a mortgage. I can I can I can invest. I can bank. I can do everything literally from my phone now. Um, and young people, even younger than me, um, they are very astute when it comes to technology and what's available out there. And so. When you're looking at financial literacy, financial education, it is extremely important to meet people where they are. I'll share this story and I'll try to make my story as, as concise and tight as possible. Imagine a, a, a world where your K through five child can play a game. This game teaches this young person about both sides of the personal finance fence. They have a small business, they're running their berry farm. Once the money comes in, you have tutorials that guide them on spending, saving, investing, and giving based upon these four money bears, right? They're playing this game. And all of a sudden, there is the ability, once this child has money, this awareness that, hey, they can spend this money, they can save this money, they can invest this money. And the technology exists today, Philip, that allows for parents with young children to buy fractional shares of companies. You can literally buy $5 worth of Coca-Cola, $5 worth of Starbucks, $5 worth of what, what things out there. So imagine now this child with this new awareness of what money can do from the age of five, six, seven, with a runway to be able to do these great things with money. Imagine that home, then imagine that community, then imagine our society as a whole where young people are aware of their financial choices and the power that they have with their finance to be able to achieve and do great things from a very young age. That's the world, the ideal world that we envision where young people aren't taught financial literacy at 17, 18 years old, if you happen to live in one of the, you know, what, 15 states that <laughs> require it, but young people starting this journey very early when it needs to be done. Mac, let me push you there. Any particular apps, any particular resources you would point to for advisors that may want to learn more? Sure. So one of the, the, the bigger ones out there is a company called Greenlight. Some folks may have heard of it. It is an app. Two of my three children have it. It is a, 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 it's a neo bank. It's a, it's a banking app. Child gets a card, picture on it, introduces them to banking, introduces them to financial literacy introduces them to investing. You can also invest with your child through the app as well. Goal Setter is another one. So there, there's a proliferation of really neat neo banks and financial literacy tools and financial applications to, to, that target younger people. Uh, Copper Bank is one of them. So there, there are quite a few out there, but th those are the ones that are doing really, really good things in the community and, and are, are building tools to engage from a young age. Thank you for sharing that. I recently saw a list of top 10 allowance apps from the Forbes magazine that I thought was interesting. So maybe Googling Forbes and allowance apps gets you to a good list overview as well. Oliver, turning to you, you recently published a book called Money Can Grow on Trees if you take care of it. Would you mind sharing your experiences, learnings, stories from that great endeavor? Yeah, thank you. Um, so 
you know, one of the things that we all struggle with is how do you communicate better with clients, with the younger generation? Um, you know, as Mac mentioned, there's now I think 17 states that require financial literacy courses in order to graduate uh, high school. This book was written in graphic novel form. There are 10 chapters. It comes with a study guide. It comes with a QR code at the end of each chapter that links to the website where there's additional materials and additional links. So yes, Mac, technology is very much part of this, even though it's in the archaic book format. It's analog. Uh, it's not digital, it's analog. It's, it's, <laughs> yes, but uh, the education market and the library market do like analog as opposed to digital uh, still. So, uh, you know, it's been a great experience because one of the things that I try to do is to use 10 different lessons that I find to be critical in terms of financial literacy from budgeting to saving to the time value of money to the risks and what the implications are of overspending and also making the very critical point that you're going to make mistakes along the way and that's okay. Mistakes are fixable. So just because you're sitting there, whether you're 16 years old, 26 years old, or 46 years old, and you say, man, I really screwed this up, um, right? Doesn't mean that you can't fix it. And this is just an additional tool, a way to communicate, hey, if you found yourself you know, doing something that you realized was a mistake, that doesn't mean give up. It means correct the mistake, and here are ways to do that. Um, Right, so it, it was a great experience. Um, obviously, I had the pleasure and the luxury of working with a great illustrator, Brian Barbosa, who really brought the stories to life. But all 10 stories are real life stories, either mistakes that I made personally or that I've observed over my life. Um, I'll share one really, really quickly because it's an environment that unfortunately I'm seeing pop up again. I just saw two ads this morning for it, what I call reloading. It's when you have a credit card balance you get enticed to transfer that balance that maybe you're being charged 20% or so in interest on to a new credit card that is waiving interest for a year or two years or whatever it might be. Generally speaking, it's a shorter period than you'd like, but you never close the first credit card. And before you know it, you're using that first credit card again and you just compound the issue and the problem. And those are the little things that I think that if you talk about them openly, if you discuss them, and if somebody like me, a financial professor says, by the way, I kind of did that when I was 20 and geez, uh, if I'd known how bad, you know, and how quickly you can get into trouble, then I would have saved myself a whole lot of heartache. So the power of learning from mistakes, your own or those of other others, no doubt. Yep. Stacy, bring us home, please. I know from our prior discussions, what a passion you have around volunteering. So if you don't mind, share your thoughts on volunteering and how it may apply to this topic at hand. Thank you, Philip. I feel really strongly that if we're going to be effective in helping our families with financial literacy, that we really need to individually commit. And there is no better place to get some training in financial literacy than volunteering in the schools. And you do have to find an on-ramp because you know schools are busy, they have lots of different mandates, um, but one of those national on-ramps might be junior achievement. Um, and the, it's, it's kind of like the Swiss army knife where there, you get lots of value from you know, like multiple aspects of value. By volunteering in the schools to teach financial literacy, you build your own skills. You, uh, it, it's incredibly helpful, I found in my experience, to learn how to explain financial concepts in more engaging, understandable terms, right? Like finding that this lifelong pursuit of the elegant simplicity we talked about. And it feels really good to give back. So I think it's one of those really amazing win-win opportunities um, again, just finding uh, in the high schools, you know, there are uh, classes on, you can get involved in judging competitions in uh, get to know the, the teacher, the econ teachers, you know, guest lecture, um, but commit to it and find those opportunities uh, in the school system. And I'm just loving all the ideas and 
and the resources, the creativity of, of Mac and Oliver and what you're contributing to, it's gotten, we've made a lot of progress in this field. Yes, we have. Thank you for sharing that. And just again, to be crystal clear, this is volunteering for us as advisors mm -hmm. to commit our own time and build networks and share knowledge that way. Awesome idea. Thank you for sharing that. Four minutes to go. We would be remiss not to quickly try to cover some of the great questions that have been coming in. The first one I want to share is specifically you, to you, Stacy. It's a trust and estate related question. And the person is asking for a person that wants to borrow money from their trust to pay help rent if they can't afford it in New York City, is that possible? Is that advisable? What are your thoughts on borrowing money from the trust to help with current expenses such as rent? Um, I would say that each trust is very specific and you really would need to understand the terms of the trust and talk to the trustee. Of course. That, that said, Philip, I would say many trusts, right, are written around health, education, maintenance, and support, the HIMSS standards that we're familiar with. And so the question would be, you know, could the trust make a distribution instead of a loan if there really is a, a legitimate, you know, need for the rent and it comes within the terms of the trust? So uh, my answer is ask the, talk to the trustee. <laughs> and, and the alignment of purpose might be the important factor in this equation. Totally get it. Thank you. The next question is an interesting one. It comes at it from the foundation, you know, perspective. We have an audience member working in the nonprofit sector for a foundation, and that person is wondering how can the notion of giving, assumingly including to nonprofits and foundations, be brought more constructively to advisors who may not be engaging, you know, on that front as actively as the three of you. What tricks, what tips would you have to activate more advisors to weave those giving conversations into the dialogue? Well, from my perspective, I think that's what differentiates what I would call an elite advisor from everybody else is to be focused on charitable giving, having that conversation about purpose that both Mac and Stacy talked about earlier. So what do you wanna do? It's not about just writing a $500 check to the local whatever. Um, it's about, okay, what are we trying to accomplish and have a full dialogue. And I think once you engage with the right individuals um, about that, and we all have clients, and it's not even a question of you've gotta be worth 20 million bucks or anything like that. It's about what is your intent and when you start bringing in intent and weaving that into the dialogue as an advisor, you solidify the relationship. You typically make it multi-generational because the family will have its own dynamic and purpose in there. And so it really benefits everyone. Excellent. Last question for now, keeping an eye on time is for you, Mac. Please put on your CFP, your former advisor hat. Assume a family structure where G1 does indeed not want to share much at all. But G2, G2 is very mature and curious. What suggestions, what good ways of approaching would you recommend for G2 to get G1 to open up and play ball? So when Stacy, I'm, I'm going to borrow from you a point that you create that you brought up earlier that I have utilized in practice with the stubborn G1 and it's called the love note to family. And interestingly enough, the story I share is with a very successful advisor whose own father did this for, father-in-law did this for her husband. And when she shared the story, there wasn't a dry eye in the room. The father wrote a letter when he was in his... 50s about what was going on in his life all these great things it was maybe a three-page letter and literally put it in an envelope and put it in the safe with all the important documents something like that where you're you, there, there's some methodology or tech there's something to get the story from here into something that can be imparted 
can be extremely powerful. It may not necessarily be financial, but it can give you an idea of what's going on in the mind of that generation. And it doesn't have to necessarily disclose dollars, but it's a good start for G1 to be able to put something somewhere that, that talks to here as well as here. And assumingly, Mac, that same technique may work the other way around. If J2 shares openly, vulnerably, yep. authentically yep. thoughts, fears, hopes, aspirations around money yes. and shares that constructively with G1, maybe they open up as all well. All we are at the end of our days, folks, literally is a collection of stories. That's literally all we are. We hear On that these note, short stories every day. Much appreciate you all sharing your stories, your perspectives with our audience today. The topic of children wealth, dear to us individually, dear to us, important to us as a profession. So upping all of our engagement involvement on that important front will be beneficial for our clients across multiple generations and us as a profession. Thank you for sharing your expertise. Thank you for the audience. In closing, a call to action. Should you be interested in the master's program at Columbia, learn more online and applications for our fourth cohort starting in the fall of 2023 are currently open. With that, we're signing off. Thank you much for your time and attention today.